Um, you know, he covers writing, consulting, educating, lecturing, wine judging, and his list under wine region expertise on the MW website must be one of the longest in the Institute, <laughs> covering most regions of Italy and New Zealand and Spain, as well as Portugal, the Lebanon and England. So this afternoon, we're here to enjoy Peter's insights into the aromatic wines of New Zealand, which I think are becoming more important with every vintage. So over to you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Rosemary. Um, without further ado, I guess I should launch right in. Um, the thing about um, New Zealand, I think, that's um, really important, you know, you've probably all seen this, this image before, but it's good to remind ourselves, it's an isolated, cool climate island. It's relatively unspoiled. There's exotic fl flora, flora and fauna, um, and it's firmly in that temperate zone. So the vineyards are between 35 and 45 degrees south. Um, while wine production does in fact extend back to the 1800s, it wasn't until the 1980s that Marlborough Sauvignon put New Zealand wine on the global wine map. And despite all the noise, we have to remember the country is responsible for less than 1% of total world wine production. Alongside a fairly high commitment uh, to quality, there's a strong commitment to the environment with over 96% of vineyards operate under the sustainability program. So, um, this little uh, image here, I guess it just gives you an idea of uh, vineyard area. Marlborough is by far and away the biggest region for production with almost 28,000 28, hectares under vine of a national total of just under 40. That's about a 70% share. Hawke's Bay comes a distant second on 5,000 and none of the next five in fact break 2,000 hectares. Mm. In terms of varieties, no surprises here. Sauvignon Blanc remains in the top spot with 25,000 hectares of vines, and that's about 63% of national plantings, perhaps down a little bit from a few years ago. Pinot Noir has forced its way into second place with, with 5,500 hectares, and Chardonnay and Pinot Gris bring up the third places. You all know this map, um, but let's just treat it as a quick reminder. I, I always feel I'm forgetting after two years of COVID travel restrictions where things are. I think rather than pointing out the regions, what's um, really important to take from this map, because it is it is actually a relief map, I think it's it's pretty it's pretty much every wine region is coastal with the exceptions of Central Otago and Waikato Bay of Plenty. And every region is protected from the wet westerlies. Before we start on the wines themselves, I'd like to ask you to think while we taste, about whether New Zealand should stick to a standard style for its aromatics. For example, if you look at Australia, dry reasoning is the style they make. Or should they be looking at more diverse styles with different levels of, say, residual sugar or with oak aging, that kind of thing. Or from a consumer point of view, maybe is that diversity a little bit more confusing? Uh, maybe it's just early days and we, we don't know for sure. So, on to the wines. Our first pair of wines are made from Albarino. Of course, this um, Iberian native is, seems to be suited to New Zealand's climate. It tends to make dry, perfumed, um, medium-bodied wines. People find ripe stone fruit and citrus aromas, uh, sometimes a kind of briny minerality about it, and it's always got really fresh cleansing acidity. And of course, uh, it's great with seafood. Um, it's a moderately vigorous variety. It likes cooler climates and it likes moisture and it retains acid even in slightly warmer climates. If you plant it on heavier soils with clay, for example, you maybe emphasize the stone fruit aspects. Uh, on lighter soils, you'll get a bit more citrus out of it. And as you can see, it's not a hugely um, important grape in terms of tonnage uh, in New Zealand, um, less than 1% of total production. Um, in winemaking terms, it's generally speaking, um, the aim is to preserve aromatics. So it's typically uh, fermented in stainless steel and often matured in stainless steel. Uh, in New Zealand, you're, you're likely to find more pure focused aromatics and crisp fruity palates. There are occasionally some barrel fermented or barrel matured um, styles, usually with older oak. Most people don't seem to think new oak's a good idea. Uh, and generally speaking, um, it, it is drunk fairly young. Our first wine comes from Gisborne. We're on the, the north, east coast of the North Island, north of Hawke's Bay. Uh, this region regularly records some of the highest sunshine and temperatures in New Zealand, which means it often tends to start the harvest first. And then our second one comes from um, Marlborough. As you know, of course, it's New Zealand's largest and best known wine region. 
you have a combination of a cool yet high sunshine climate, low rainfall and free draining, relative, moderately fertile um, soils. And it tends to produce a style, we all know that sort of vivid fruity uh, style. As the region matures, um, new subregions are being recognized with more diverse soils and mesoclimates. Both of the wines we have in this lineup today are from the heartland in the Wairau Valley, which you can see on your map, uh, is that north, uh, the most northerly of, of, of those three subzones. Sub Here we have um, old gravelly riverbed soils. There's a certainly a degree of diversity across that. Um, but broadly speaking, you find cooler, drier inland sites. Uh, they're quite stony. You can find some early ripening sites. And then on near the coast, there's definitely an even a cooling effect from the sea breezes. You can just, I think, see Renwick on the map there. That's the west of Blenheim Township. Uh, both of the Marlborough wines are grown close by. So without further ado, I think we should probably look at the, our first two wines. Um, the left field Albarino from Gisborne and uh, the Nautilus from Marlborough. Probably helps if we put them in the glass, doesn't it? Okay, so left field, of course, is a, is a, a, a label of Tiawa, which was a, an independent state that is now part of the, the Villa Maria stable. Um, and here in 2020, they had a relatively cool spring uh, with a dry summer, so they got pretty good ripeness. Um, the wine was picked, or the grapes were picked and gently pressed straight um, into stainless steel. 85% of the clear juice was racked and fermented with yeast to highlight the aromatics and texture, and the remaining 15% went into seasoned French oak punchins to add a bit of complexity and richness. Now, my first impression um, is that this is more fruity than we might expect from a typical Iberian Albarino, Albarino, although on second thoughts, maybe that's a little bit rash. I will say, you, I think you can see they've gone for an aromatic yeast here. So it's fruity, offering... For me, ripe apples, subtle stone fruit, a suggestion of lime and something floral, maybe even a touch of minerality by which I probably mean reduction. And thinking about it, maybe my first impression wasn't quite correct. In fact, I'm now beginning to think maybe it isn't as fruity as we might expect a Kiwi white to be. I'm very keen to hear your thoughts on that. In the mouth. There's weight and richness and lovely freshness, flavors of ripe pears, fresh fruit salad. There's a pleasing texture. Perhaps that's due to that small portion that was fermented in oak. You don't get overt oak flavor, but I really like that textural um, dimension. The acidity is perfectly balanced. And I have to say, I think this is rather delicious. Alcohol 13 and a half, residual sugar four grams. Now what's interesting, I know that my personal threshold of perception for sweetness is, is maybe a little higher than some people's, but I don't notice that sweetness. I think the balance is really good here. Um, anyone want any, any comments on, on this wine at this stage? Particularly, I guess, A, about whether or not you notice that sweetness. And second, that, that idea about, do you think it's kind of, is it fruitier than you expect from New Zealand? Is it, or how does it compare maybe to, to an Iberian example? Anyone want to share a thought? Don't forget to come off, off mute if you do. Other thing you can do if you're feeling shy, of course, is um, use the chat function. Okay, so let's look at the second one. So this one uh, is uh, from Marlborough. It's the Nautilus Estate, 2019. 2019 started uh, pretty well. There were no frost issues. They had some spring rains, which were nice. Then January and February were, were pretty dry with almost no rainfall and warmer than average temperatures. Harvest period was kind, as they say. Um, and they ended up um, with a very nice um, low to moderate crop, really healthy fruit, and they were pretty happy uh, with what they achieved. Fruit was hand-picked, um, chilled overnight before destemming and crushing prior to pressing. Cool fermented in a stainless steel tank using an aromatic yeast. And there was a short period of, of maturation on yeast leaves for, uh, prior to bottling. 
Now, my first impression with this is it's slightly, um, slightly more pungent than the left field. But maybe that's a fa factor of just being a year older and showing a bit more development. It's certainly quite different in style. There's something, something a bit steely there. Um, I really don't want to push this one too far. But for a moment there, it was a, a bit reminiscent of the extraordinary Selección Especial from Senorans in Rias Baixas um, that ages in stainless steel for at least three years, I think maybe longer. Um, this does, as I said, spend a little bit of time in yeasties, and I don't want to push that comparison too far, but I'm wondering if that is part of what's going on here. Um, in the mouth, I don't find this extraordinarily fruity, certainly in primary terms. Again, maybe the, the notes of evolution seem more important. There's a kind of gentle rather than explosive fruit and a pleasing roundness. It isn't a, it isn't a blockbuster, but it's a bit stealth-like. I actually think that this will give people a lot of pleasure as a wine to drink, probably with food. Uh, interestingly, again, this one um, has four grams per litre residual sugar, 13% alcohol. And again, I wouldn't say that I particularly noticed. I'm wondering if, if, if people, um, if, but when you're tasting, if you look at the tasting sheet and look at the sugar and then, or if it, I'm one of these people who tries not to look before I do, but I, I, I'm not sure that I would describe either of these wines as having obvious sweetness. Do you prefer one style over the other? That's, I guess that's trying to approach this question of, you know, is there a, is there a correct style or maybe is it too early to say? Any thoughts on that? Second, uh, hi, Peter, first of all. Uh, uh, greetings from Russia. I have say, uh, thankfully, I received my samples to Russia. So excellent. my friend, uh, Andrea sent it to England, and from England, my friend brought it to Russia. So I tasted it right away from Russia. So second wine uh, has a little bit petrolian notes, so you feel a lot of development, and, you and it's a little bit contradictory because you have a little bit sugar plus petrol, so it's a little bit unusual. You don't expect it from uh, Albania. Okay. So which do you prefer? Uh, <clears throat> first one, it's, uh, you expect it from Alvarinia, so it's good, floral, easy going. Uh, second, I think it's more intellectual and for specific food, so you need to think about this one. It's, it's not entry level, it's different. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Okay. I think the first one is more what you would expect from Alborino. You know, it's got those sort of more peachy, ripe flavours. And you're, you're more aware of the, res the residual sugar than in the second wine. Yes. The second wine to me tastes actually dry. I mean, I'm quite surprised there's that, that amount of residual sugar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, I agree with Ro uh, Rosemary as well. I think uh, the left field is very similar in terms of expression to a Ria, uh, Ria Spacious or Ria Spacious. I think the Marlboro one I feel is expressing terroir a lot more. It's It's got a little bit of a punch of a grass, grassy herbalness to it, which kind of will make me believe it's not Alberino. So it, it uh, shows quite, uh, it's, it's a bit of a surprise to me that Alberino can come out with different uh, different flavors and aromas. And yeah, it's, it's got a lot more, it, it has the saltiness, but also a bit of smokiness to it. And um, sugar on, on both of them are absolutely fabulous. It's very difficult to make out unless you really focus on the acidity and then compare it with the sugar levels. Um, I, I like both of them, actually. <laughs> I like the Marlboro style because it's a bit unique. It's not the similar style as an Alberino you would expect from Spain. It seems more reminiscent. It reminds me of New Zealand. Great. I'm not sure I want to be a reminder of New Zealand since I can't go. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> It'll come. It'll come. Great. Okay. So, uh, moving uh, swiftly on, uh, our second flight um, is, is a bit of a mixed bag. First up um, is a Viognier. And of course, Viognier uh, is a French variety from the Rhone Valley. It's notably aromatic. People find stone fruit, ripe apricots and peach, uh, sometimes honeysuckle and other uh, floral notes. It's quite textural. People often talk about it being oily um, and richly rich, full-bodied. Um, it likes a longer, warmer growing season. It's drought tolerant, a little bit prone to, to um, powdery mildew. Doesn't necessarily keep its acid as it gains alcohol. So it does require some, some hard work in, the, in terms of site, site selection and vineyard management. 
and you really do need to to pick it in the right window to capture the optimum varietal character. Um, as you can see, there's even less Viognier in New Zealand than there is Albarino. Uh, quite often uh, in New Zealand, stainless steel fermentation is more common. Um, there is a little oak sometimes used uh, in Lee's work is typical. Uh, it's people, particularly in Hawke's Bay, maybe are uh, co-fermenting with Syrah to give, it a, to give the Syrah a bit of a, a aromatic lift. Um, most of the um, Viognier in New Zealand in New Zealand is found in Hawke's Bay and a little bit in, in Marlborough, um, but there's a mere 20, 240 tonnes in the whole country. Uh, and here we are in Hawke's Bay, and again, you'll have to maybe squint at, at um, this, this map. Um, if you can see, um, the just to the um, west of Napier City, there's a, an area labelled Dart, Dartmoor Valley, uh, just below the Y in Valley uh, is where Tamata have their um, Woodthorpe Vineyard, uh, and that's where the grapes for this Viognier come from. So here's our pair. Um, I'm, I don't feel terribly strong about this, but you might just want to taste the Viognier before the, uh, the Te Whare Rā. Uh, there's a little bit of residual sugar in the Te Whare Rā, but I'm not sure it's actually going to make a huge difference. Um, but I think in terms of um, what we're doing now, I think I'm, I'm going to stick to the tasting order when I'm talking about um, these wines. So Te Whare Rā uh, is single vineyard 5182 Toru field blend from 2020. Um, and as I said earlier, this is, uh, they're in, in Renwick, uh, in, it's sort of in the heart of the Wairau Valley in Marlborough. It's owned by a couple, Anna and Jason Flowday. It's one of the oldest vineyards in Marlborough. Um, it's small, 11 hectares, and it's, one, it's certified organic. This number I mentioned, you may be wondering what 5182 stands for. Um, it's very significant to the Flowdays because it's the vineyard designation number they got from BioGrow New Zealand. And so for them, it represents all of the work and effort they've put in over the last 11 years to achieve organic certification and also represents all the things they feel are important, provenance, organic farming and authenticity and wines coming from Marlborough. So Toru means three in Maori and it's a co-fermented field blend of three varieties, Gewürztraminer, Riesling and Pinot Green. It has, they like to say, the aromatic spice and weight of Gewürztraminer, the structure and length of Riesling and the texture, the great texture of Pinot Gris. Now, 2020 was a Goldilocks, Goldilocks vintage. Um, they had uh, moderate crops, um, a fruit set, a very even fruit set. It was a warm, dry summer, a um, bit like 2016, no major heat spikes. The grapes were hand-picked, hand-sorted, de-stemmed, lightly crushed and pressed. Some parcels had longer skin time, but the whole lot was co-fermented. Uh, the wine was not fined, and it's actually vegan and vegetarian friendly. So, so when I first smelled this, it's 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 got a lovely harmonious nose, loads mm. of fruit, but nothing standing out awkwardly. I guess, which is another way of saying the Gewurz doesn't dominate for me. Um, as it warms up and opens up, it has these almost um, sort of lush fruity notes, and there's a kind of um, terpeny savory edge which I rather like. Mm. In the mouth it really does seem to encapsulate the three varieties. It's hard to say one predominates but there are delicious layers of fruit flavors. There's a firm backbone to it and I think that's partly to do with the acidity and I partly I think there's a sort of skin derived grip to it maybe from that skin contact. Um, quite long flavour. I think it's really delicious. And I think maybe looking at this, for me, I, I really like this sort of seamless flavours here. That, and I think that definitely is down to the, the co-fermentation. And again, the balance is good. I think that six grams of residual really helps to sort of balance out the grip that you get from that skin contact. Um, any thoughts on that? Delicious. <laughs> I agree with you, Peter. <laughs> I think it's really delicious, and and, and discovery, and I think it, yeah, it's it's, uh, you know, I think sometimes those aromatic varieties, particularly Gewurz, me can be maybe a little unfashionable because people think they're really obvious. But I think here, this this co fermentation gives you something, gives lovely complex flavors. It's really delicious, as you said, 
And the balance is lovely. Are they approximately the same amount of gram? I mean, it's a little vaguely one third, one third, it's one third. It's pretty much one third, one third, one third. No, because no, they don't, they're very harmonious. You know, one doesn't dominate the others, which is surprising yeah. with Gilberts. Well, well exactly. I think it's always the problem with Gewurz is when you first start in wine, you're very excited because it's probably the first um, grape you can identify blind. Yeah. And then, and then sometimes I think we get a bit tired of it. But when it's done properly, I think it is a delicious grape. But it is, it is quite full throated, and and sometimes maybe it's too much of a good thing. But here I'm, I'm really happy. That's okay. I was just going to add one, one thing. I, I really love the texture, the skin contact. Um, but looking at the sugar content, I'm, I'm very surprised actually seeing that it's six grams per litre. And that carries it really well. And I wonder if that helps amplify. I th absolutely. I think that really helps with the balance. I mean, I, li I like that sort of that texture and that grip. But maybe without that sugar, it might seem a little um, mm. too grippy, maybe. Mm. Peter, I don't have samples. I'm interested to know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested. Um, it reminds me of Marcel Dice's uh, field blends. Is, I don't have the samples. Is there any similarity or what? Um, it's funny because when I was doing a pre-taste, I did think about Engelgarten. I do think there's definitely, yes, I, I thought, um, <clears throat> yes. Thank you. I mean, I think maybe the Dice wines have a little bit more intensity um, but I think I think you know it's not it's not a, a ridiculous comparison at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, I, 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 examples. I have a very embarrassing question. Um, I've been trying to for the last fifteen minutes to open uh, the Zara Yonier, um, and I have now wait for my husband to come back in the evening, evening to open it. But but how would that compare with a? Um, is it more leaner in texture as compared to um, a Rhone Valley? Um, oh, well, let's, let's get on to it. Let's, let, let's have a bit, a bit of a chat about it. Um, okay. um, by the way, pliers, I, I had to use pliers on one of my bottles. If you've got, ah. a, got a set of pliers, they'll get it off. Okay. Um, so the tomato uh, is named after Zara, who's the firstborn of the third generation of the Buck family who owned tomato. Um, and... Um, the, 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 as I said earlier, these are from Woodthorpe Terraces Vineyard, which is in the northern part of Hawke's Bay. Um, ferments were done individually uh, before blending, and there was fining before bottling. Um, when you smell this, I mean, it, I think it does smell um, of Viognier. It's got a peachy nose. There's some floral spice nuance, maybe almost a bit of ginger or gingerbread in there, mm. and something herbal but maybe not not green herbs but more like herb seeds i mean maybe even a, a little hint of of fennel or caraway something mm. like that i go with fennel yeah i have a feeling that this is going to open up in the glass um i think it's a really good candidate for aeration or, or even decanting um i think there's something about roan varieties i think often that that white varieties that reward decanting How does the peaking regime go in uh, Hawke's Bay for uh, Viognier? Do you have any um, information on that? Again? Uh, when are these uh, grapes picked? Um, how is the acidity um, uh, levels matched? Uh, are they probably more, more acidic um, than French uh, Viognier? Right? I, I mean, this was picked third week of March, like towards the end of March. Um, I don't think they adjust acidity, but I don't know for sure. But the the, the figure they give is 5.1 grams of, of tartaric equivalent. Um, and a, a, that's a really interesting point because um, I think there is, it's not high acid, but there's enough acid here. I think it's diff it's not flabby or, or soft at all. I think it's got authentic Viognier flavor. You know, there's that peach and honeysuckle I was talking about before, a lovely balance. And I have to say, I, I'm a big fan of Viognier, but often I'm disappointed by Viognier. I think Viognier, in outside of Condrio can often just be a bit boring I think it's just it, you know I want it to to threaten to be over the top I don't want it to be over the top but I want it to be quite aromatic and assertive um, and I think I think this finds that right balance between being expressive and not OTT and and quite nuanced um, you know maybe Viognier is not a great we think of as being subtle and fine but I think they've they've done a really good job of, of actually trying to to make a, a more elegant style because it is, you know, it is prone to having plenty of 
alcohol and, and texture and so on. Thank you. Is it uh, pure Viognier, Peter, or is there anything else included in it? As far as we know, it's pure Viognier. I don't have any reason not to think it is. Um, and they, they've got to have been one of the pioneers of Viognier in Hawke's Bay, I think. So I'm, I, I think it is, is pure. I know that um, Trinity Hill sometimes blend um, Marsan. They've got a Marsan a Viognier blend, but that's the only... Off the top of my head, that's the only one, only blend I can think of. Peter, do you think the fact it's bottled under cork, one of the unusual ones, would Thank you. make a difference to the longevity? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, There's only two know, wines I... in this lineup that are under cork, you see. So I just thought. Is it, the, sorry, is it the only one with under cork? No, the proper truck is as well. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question because it is, you know, there's that, there's that whole theory uh, that you've got, you're supposed to drink Viognier young or leave it and drink it old. And I, I have to say, I'm not sure anybody on this call has had a really old Viognier or, or Condria. I, Rosemary, I'm, I'm going to hope that you might have had that experience, but I, I certainly have mm -hmm. never had an old one. Um, no. Neither. So you know, there's a there's a theory that sort of in the in the in the, in the middle ground, it's salts and it's boring. Um, so I, to be honest, I've only ever drunk um, young Viognier, I think. Yeah, me too. It could be just a producer choice to put it into cork, anyway. It's not about the style. You absolutely, know. absolutely. Has anyone had an old one? Um, yes, I've got some uh, Georges Vernet Cote de Vernon, two thousand and four. Ooh. Hmm. Um, which is a style I do love, yes. <laughs> so definitely ages for you. Excellent. That, that I think that one, um, I'm not sure there are many, many brands that would like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's possibly right. Maybe, um, maybe um, Gigal the tech sheet. Dorian. The, the tech sheet said something about it lasts three to four years from harvest. So maybe yeah, so they're not particularly to... expecting us to, to age it for sure. And again, I think that's probably a little bit of a challenge for New Zealand people in the market. That there's, there's an expectation from consumers that because they're New Zealand wines, because they're New World wines, and they tend to be usually up front and forward, that they don't need to be aged, that you know, you, you're supposed to drink them early. Okay. Patricia Stavanovich has put a note in saying she's had a 15 year old Chateau Grier, which is delicious, <laughs> which I'm not surprised about really. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just like, um, I must admit, I'm not the world's biggest fan of Viognier. And I like it when it loses that wisteria or glycine in French uh, quality. It's a lot less for, for, uh, floral. And it's more like, a subtle version, and and so I quite like them when they're older. Okay, and and in terms of in terms of structure, they still I guess because they do often they do have a little more um, phenolics. Maybe that actually can help them age la longer. Actually, Peter, that's exactly right. In fact, it's that slight astringency or even bitterness that give them the structure as they've aged because they don't necessarily have that much acidity even when they're young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent, good. So, uh, moving swiftly on uh, to Pinot Gris. So, um, what do we expect from Pinot Gris? Sometimes people just think it's kind of like toned down Gewürztraminer, but we definitely expect to find ripe pears, apples, some spice, maybe a bit of breadiness, maybe some floral notes. Um, I think probably, certainly New Zealand, um, they're looking more towards Alsace and style than that dry Pinot Grigio style from Italy. And I've got a comment about that I'm, uh, I'm gonna make later. Um, in terms of clones, they have Mission and Barry. Grapes are thin skin, bunches are tight. It can be a bit of an erratic cropper and Harvest date is critical because um, it because it tends to lose its acidity. 
Uh, it can also put sugars on quite dramatically towards the end. Uh, and sometimes you can end up with maybe slightly um, unbalanced wines. Fermentation is generally done quite cool to preserve fruit aromas and purity. Um, stainless steel fermentation is, is fairly common to highlight fruit, but oak and uh, usually older oak is, is sometimes used for a proportion of fruit uh, to give you a bit more complex in texture. Uh, people are also playing around with wild yeast and aging on yeast lees to try and get uh, a bit more complexity and, and texture. Um, in my view, I think there was a time when Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris, was seen as the next big thing in New Zealand. People were very excited about it. It was, it was the, the new alternative of Sauvignon Blanc. And I, th I think for a while they weren't really sure where they were going with it. Um, the cynics might say they had the yields were too high because they thought they could crop it um, the way they cropped Sauvignon Blanc. And the problem then is Pinot, Pinot Gris tends to take a while to get phenolic ripeness and you would end up with kind of boring wine so they'd leave them longer on the vine and then the sugars would shoot up and you you could end up with these sort of head banging wines that had quite a lot of residual sugar and high alcohol and maybe they still didn't really have the flavor to go with it you know Olivia Humbres can maybe get away with that um, and I think I think things have settled down people have started to, to figure out what they're doing so today there's 28,000 tonnes of Pinot Gris grown in New Zealand. That's 10 times as much Albarino, but it's only about 6% of uh, total wine production. In terms of regions, you'll find it all over the country, but Marlborough is number one, followed by Hawke's Bay, and then further back, uh, Gisborne and Canterbury. First wine comes from Wairarapa. Wairarapa, of course, means glistening waters in Māori. It's quite a compact region, a lot of small producers, uh, it's got a great early history. Vines were planted in 1883, but the temperance movement in 1905 put, paid to that. And the modern history of Wairarapa dates from the late 1970s, but these days they've got some pretty, pretty good name, pretty big names there. Small producers, but big names. Uh, there are three main subregions, broadly similar in terms of climate and soils, uh, but Mahambra is the best known of these three, and it's the home of our next wine. It's the most southerly subregion both free free draining soils often um, on river terrace stony uh, gravelly river terraces uh, and it's got a cool dry climate and sometimes people find some similarities with burgundy a friend of mine a winemaking friend said to me once he thought that the the best aromatic wines in new zealand were made in martindra so we'll have to see for ourselves second of this pair uh is from central otago and the famous um uh, Signor Bragata, who wrote a report for the government in 1895, described Centro Otago as preeminently suitable for winemaking. The first gold medal wine produced in Centro Otago um, was, well, it received a gold medal in 1881, and it was called Burgundy. Oh. Um, as time went by again, because of things like temperance, it all went to pot. Stone fruit was the most important crop for years until you had a, a small uh, restart in the 1950s and then in the 70s there were modern day pioneers if you like like Chard Farm, Ripon, Black Ridge and Gibson. Central Otago is the nearest New Zealand gets to a continental climate and it's a fairly extreme climate so site selection is really important but it will reward you with wines of intensity and finesse and they, it, it probably forces us to think about sub-regional expression. There's, not, there's probably more distinctive sub-regions in Central Otago than any other region in New Zealand, maybe. Today's wine is from Bendigo. Uh, and again, you might need to squint at that map, but uh, we're northeast of Cromwell on the eastern side of Lake Dunstan. Bendigo's got vines uh, on gentle north facing slopes. Remember we're in the Southern hemisphere. So north facing is the equivalent of south facing in the Northern hemisphere. Uh, there's quite a lot of planting there now on stony soils and you get hot summer sun and cold clear nights. Ultimately, it can be one of the warmer um, subregions in central Otago. And I think um, Rudy Bauer might even have a little bit of syrah there. I'm not sure if he actually still does or if he gets a crop off it every year, but uh, it, is, it, it can be warmer than a lot of other parts of central Otago. So onto the wines. Um, there's the um, Gris from um, uh, uh, Larry McKenna at Escarpment and the Prophet's Rock uh, from Bendigo. 
So I absolutely love it. It's so nice. Chamomile, alpine herbs, touch of oil. It's beautiful. Excellent. So, uh, as I said, this is from escarpment. The gris comes from escarpment. We're on these gravel terraces I talked about before uh, on the so-called Martinborough Terrace. 2019 was a classic warm, dry summer. They had a small crop. Um, and there's barrel fermentation, and, and Larry finds his sort of inspiration, if you like, in, in Burgundy. There was partial malolactic fermentation and lee stirring to try and get more texture and mouthfeel. So it's it's fragrant. It's got in, mm. for me, it's got enticing yet it's quite subtle spice. It's definitely a savory edge, maybe from that ye lee stirring. Um, and there's a ripeness in that fruit. There's melon, there's ripe fresh pears. And there's some, a hint of something exotic and maybe elusive. As Tatiana said, I think it's really delicious. It's a really textural palette. And funny enough, even though it's not like Pinot Grigio, it, it is somehow, that texture does seem to me to be a little bit Italianate. There's a richness and a roundness. There's a really nice bite here. Now, I've, I've, in the introduction, I was talking about the relatively low um, acidity in Pinot Gris, and the number here is 5.9, which is not so low, but it's not that high. But interestingly, the pH is 3.16, and I think that low pH really contributes to that lovely bite here and that balance. It's long and dry and satisfying, and I think it's sort of got quite, it's quite ambitiously built. Um, and I think that's interesting. I think that barrel fermentation, that lee stirring, maybe they reduce the aromatic intensity, but they bring more weight and texture. It's interesting because I looked at the numbers before and the acid's a bit higher than the Viognier, but the pH is significantly lower. So I think that really is, pH here is really, really important. On to Central Otago. So, Vintage 2019 was a bit mixed in the spring. It was wet in November, uh, and summer really only arrived around Christmas, which doesn't surprise New Zealand. Uh, it was warm in January and February, but no major heat waves. February was dry. They had some major rain in March, which cooled things down, um, but they ended up at harvest with mild temperatures, good ripeness, and good acidity. Um, interesting, again, like many of these wines, this was hand-picked. And, it, you know, it's something maybe we don't think about coming from New Zealand. Maybe it's a key it's a key element if you're looking for, with aromatic grapes, if you're not looking for coarseness. You know, they were hand-picked from the estate vineyards, mostly from a, a vineyard called Rocky Point. Uh, it's free-draining, schister soil. Uh, it's one of the steepest blocks in central Otago. Um, and maybe harking back to my comment before about, about hang time and so on, but uh, they said they put a lot of work into canopy management and crop management to try and make sure they got full physiological ripeness with lots of concentration, aromatics and flavour. And yields were low. Um, they did not exceed 38 uh, hectolitres per hectare. So that's uh, maybe the answer to my comment earlier that people in the past were pushing things too high. Both of these producers have talked about low yields and here we go. Fruit um, was whole bunch pressed over about five or six hours and then fermented uh, using only indigenous yeast in old barrels. So it took about three or four months, so quite slow. And then it was, it was aged without racking on gross leaves into a bottling just before the following vintage. Paul Pujol, the winemaker here, um, he's worked at Kunzbass in uh, Alsace, and he thinks this has really shaped his approach with aromatic whites in central Otago. So immediately there's more color than the escarpment uh, and there's definitely more aroma and surprise, surprise, it smells maybe a little more Alsatian. Baking spice, sweet spice, potpourri, ripe pears and, and ripe nectarines. It somehow smells like it's gonna be strong, but it's actually only 13.2. And again, that answers my, my little gripe earlier. It's not excessively high in alcohol. Um, what are the acidity levels? Um... 
between the two Pinot Gris, please? Over here, six, six grams. Uh, the, the second one is higher. Uh, yes. Just Marginally, just... yeah. Sweeter. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and pH on this is slightly higher too. Not such a surprise. Um, again, it, there is discernible sweetness here, but I think there's a lovely balance. The acidity is good. And as I said, the pH is relatively low, not as low as the escarpment. Um, flavors, as you might expect, of, of rose and potpourri and poached stone fruit. And I think this is a wine that's got real presence and, and character. Um, Maybe that sweetness might make it a bit harder to match with food, but I think it could be great with certain things. Of course, there's a kind of obvious thoughts about spicy and Southeast Asian cuisines. Um, but I have to say, I was thinking about roast chicken with truffles, I think, or, you know, some kind of maybe morels or, you know, one of those sort of earthy, um, meaty kind of seasonings uh, for chicken. Uh, that's where I think I would like to go. So here's the question for you all, because, you know, I think this is, the, again, a bit like the Alberinos, there's, there's two quite distinct styles. Larry describes his style as Burgundian, and Paul unashamedly Alsatian. But I've sort of wondered um, as well whether or not New Zealand should be looking at a Pinot Grigio style. My suspicion is that a lot of New Zealand winemakers have only tasted cheap generic Pinot Grigio and that's the last thing they want to be associated with but I'm talking about something superior maybe from Friuli maybe from Alto Adige so what do we think should New Zealand be uh trying to come up with a style or should they still be free to play thoughts why should you hamper creativity yeah, you can produce a lot of styles uh, you should <laughs> I think that's it. that's the easy answer, and I, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess the only response is, but maybe how do consumers know? But then you could say that about lots of wine, really. Yeah, but are consumers really looking for a particular style? I think the the younger generation is very uh, adventurous in trying out a lot of different styles, and if if each style has a strength to match with a particular moment, occasion, or food, um, and New Zealand can can, can can play with these um, and, and actually can deliver good harmonious wines and I think we should we should we should be able we should actually confuse the customers and not not confuse but maybe delight the customers with the area of styles that can come out I, I love both of them actually in yeah. fact both of them have um, a level of vibrance which is also distinct from from the French styles, um, not not to say anything negative about the French styles, but I think that this is very key to New Zealand, and, and that is the style that that is what I find um, close to New Zealand's uh, expression: the the vibrancy in the wines. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think in this particular case, both of these winemakers are very thoughtful. You know, they're they you know they they really do think about what they're trying to do, and I think that's that's what maybe contributes to what makes these wines um, so exciting. Um, I'm slightly conscious of time because I'm sure people, despite the, I don't know if it's raining where you are, but it's pouring where I am, but you may have other things to do. So I'm gonna uh, push things along a little bit. Um, and talk about, hang on, where have we gone? Yeah, sorry, uh, on, on to, let's get my slides up, on to Riesling. Now, um, Stainless steel fermentation is pretty common. People use carbon dioxide to prevent oxidation. Sometimes a little bit of skin contact to boost flavors in early drinking wines. Uh, but if people are looking for elegance and aging, maybe less skin contact. Uh, there's just about 5,000 tons produced. So clearly Riesling is a minority sport. Like many of us, I've long been a fan of Riesling, but as a Kiwi, I guess I've been sometimes frustrated that Kiwi Rieslings weren't better. A few years ago, I judged a lineup for the canter uh, of New Zealand and Australian Rieslings, and I'm afraid that Australia spanked New Zealand. Um, and I put this to a winemaker once who happened to make very good Riesling, and she said to me that the problem was there hadn't been much clonal selection done. There wasn't much chance to, there, there weren't, people weren't um, trying to find new clones, bringing in new clones, because of course New Zealand has quarantine. And I, I think maybe that has changed a bit more. Um, 
but I would say that the next two wines are made by people who have a, a record of um, taking Riesling very seriously. In terms of the regions, uh, once again, New Zealand, uh, Marlborough is number one, but clearly Plan is insignificant um, compared to Sauvignon Blanc. But North Canterbury comes not too far behind in second place, but we're still not talking about huge areas under vine, less than 200 hectares. Now, when I was a lad, um, my first job in, in uh, wine professionally in New Zealand was working in a restaurant in Auckland more years ago than I care to remember. And at the time, Corbin's, which is a name that's sadly gone, made an excellent Riesling from Wipera. And I think Rosemary, did you ever come across, they called, I think it was called Amberley Riesling. Yeah, yes. It was good, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Not just sort of some misty-eyed his history thing. Okay, so if you look at the next map, we'll zoom in a bit, and you can find Amberley um, at the oh. bottom of the map. What's slightly annoying is you really do have to squint uh, to find the Waipara River, which of course formed the Waipara Valley, but it is there. It's just discernible, running northwest to southwest, more or less through Waipara Town, uh, which is there in white. And um, you can see more or less due east of Amberley, you'll see the, the mouth of the river uh, marked on the map. The key to many of the best sites in Waipara is the Teviotdale Hills marked there um, along the coast, which shelter the vineyards from the frequent and cooling easterly sea breezes. I grew up in Christchurch, just to the south, if I can tell you. A really good summer day is often spoiled by a really nippy breeze coming off the sea. Now, back to those Teviotdale Hills. In the lee of those hills, you'll find Pegasus, Pegasus Bay Vineyard, which is named, of course, after the large local bay here. So the wines we've got here, uh, the Framingham F-Series Old Vine Riesling from Marlborough and the Pegasus Bay Riesling uh, uh, from Can North Canterbury 2018. Uh, so the grapes of the F-Series um, were selected from organically grown vines planted in the early 80s in Renwick. So again, we're in Renwick, right in the heart of the Wairau Valley. It's war relatively warm there, uh, low rainfall, low frost risk, um, and they, they feel they're able to control the yields they get and harvest at the right level of, of ripeness. These grapes actually are grown around the cellar door. Soils here are old riverbed types. We've got fist-sized stones composed of gray wacky, which is a kind of um, sandstone. Uh, large chunks of the coastal or the plains in New Zealand are made from um, gray wacky. Um, and there's a bit of alluvial gravel and silt as well. Vineyard practice at, at, here at Framingham is, is the idea is to produce ripe grapes that have maximum hang time in the vine. And again, everything is hand half harvested. So we've got naturally low yielding vines producing small crops of intensely flavored grapes. A winemaker here, and I think this may have been uh, his last vineyard was Andrew Hendry, who was a, a Geordie uh, who really loved Riesling. So Framing always took um, Riesling very seriously. 2020 was warm, cool rains after the spring. Uh, you had a nice balanced yield potential and there was plenty of water during the vegetative cycle. There's a bit of drought during the summer and temperatures dropped. So they had a lot, nice long um, ripening period and grapes were picked in optimum conditions. Um, as I said, hand-picked grapes, 90% uh, were immediately whole bunch pressed while the remaining 10% were destemmed and spent uh, 12 hours on their skins. Then um, the musts, which were unclarified and unsulfured, were settled for 12 hours before racking off the gross solids into a mixture of stainless steel and about 20% um, acacia puncheon, so seasoned, so used acacia puncheons. Spontaneous fermentation uh, until the wine was more or less dry, but as Andrew says, dry-ish. And then the components were left on, on ferment leaves for nine months before blending and bottling. So let's have a look. Mm. Uh, the winemaker himself calls this an old world style Riesling. I have to say the aromas are lovely. It's maybe not as full on as some European styles, but it's still very much sort of come hither. And again, maybe, maybe it's that, that slow wild ferment and that partial um, wood aging or wood fermentation. And then that long leaves aging that again gives you 
maybe reins back the aromas a little bit, um, but gives you more texture when you when you actually um, come to taste it. I think there's a kind of um, purity and a directness here. Orchard fruits, a um, bit of streak of lime, um, maybe a little back note of nectar. I'm feeling a bit Robert Parkerish. I'm, I think I described that as electrifying um, <laughs> mouthful of fruit. It's gorgeous. It's ripe. But here's this. It's not overripe. It's, it's, it's just lovely. It's super fresh, super clean, zesty. Um, uh, and you can tell I'm a fan. I think it's really seamlessly put together. This lovely balance. And I think that small amount of residual sugar seems to bring... Um, breadth and weight rather than explicit sweetness for me. Um, I think this is delicious wine. Um, I could drink it right now. Uh, I think it would also um, sell it really well. Okay, last wine. So the Pegasus Bay um, family business, uh, the Donaldsons planted in 1976. Uh, and in fact, I think that was the first vineyard in Canterbury then. Um, they went on to establish Pegasus Bay in 1986. Uh, the, the four sons and spouses are all involved in the business. As I pointed out earlier, they're, they're just in the lee of the Teviotdale range on um, these terraces, free draining, north facing. Um, vines are about 30 years old and most of them are on their own roots. Soil fertility is low, so vine vigor is low and yields are therefore low. Even though it can get quite warm on these north facing slopes, um, nights can be very cool in this part of the Waipra Valley. So you tend to have an elongated uh, ripening period. 2018 was a hot summer. Um, they did have some rain in the summer, but it tended to drain away relatively quickly and they had a really dry autumn. So the fruit was picked in, in really excellent condition. Typically with this wine, they like to give it a long hang time and they're not afraid of a little bit of botrytis. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of botrytis in this vintage because maybe because of the heat and the dryness at, at harvest. Um, it was a pretty hot um, summer. Free run juice was fermented at cool temperatures um, and they've they left a little bit of CO2 in it, although because these bottles have been uh, decanted you may not pick up any CO2 now. So my first impression, um, maybe there's a tiny bit of botrytis, but I'm not sure that I'm getting much. It seems to me a little bit more subdued than the Framingham. Ripe apples, it's like walking into an apple storm, fashioned apple storm. There's a hint of apple strudel, I think. Um, and I guess for me, when I say apple strudel, that, that encompasses a, a notion of a little bit of spice, some kind of dried fruit, maybe a bit of lemon peel. When you taste it, there's a sense of something muscular, more burly even, particularly compared to the Framingham. It's not coarse or brutish, but it's there's a kind of hidden power and weight. Interestingly, it's the same alcohol, 13% as the Framingham, but it feels stronger. Um, I think the sweetness works really well, but I'm a little sucker for sweetness. I think maybe it's camouflaging some of that quite stern structure. I'd say it's not as pretty as the Framingham, but it's serious and proper, but I think I would also keep this. So my question to you is, A, do you like these? Mm. And maybe we've, we've sort of talked about sales, but do you think New Zealand needs, New Zealand racing needs residual sugar? Place for both. <laughs> sitting, on the, sitting on the fence, but it's true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're both delicious in different ways. Yeah. You get back to the portrait type of fur. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. It does work perfectly. Nancy, do you want to put your comment forward? Oh, well, thank you. Um, yes, I'm absolutely, I love the, the last two, the, the recent, I thought a really great pair um, and, and character came through. And the, and the more general comment was that um, I think where texture has been achieved through skin contact, it's really helped to underline um, the varietal character in each case. Um, but the question was, um, is acacia used quite widely in New Zealand or, or at least is it expanding in, in its use? 
That's the first time I've I've found that in somebody's technical notes. Um, uh, I have to ha have to have a, a deeper dig. I'm not particularly aware of it. Um, Chris might have a view on that, but I'm I'm not sure it's um, a uh, one, big thing. One of the, the reasons I ask is because I notice it um, increasingly, albeit in a very small scale, but in the wines of northeast Italy in Alto Adige. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think I suppose come, I talked before about you know uh, the, the um, Pinot Big. Pinot Gris winemakers being sort of serious and questing and I think maybe it's not entirely a coincidence but I think most of the winemakers here are definitely people who are looking beyond the obvious you know that it must be slightly frustrating sometimes New Zealand's success has been built on Sauvignon Blanc and and you can't deny that but people like the directness of it and I think if if you're trying to go and do something different um then there seems to be a real incentive to really be different and take it seriously and, and innovate. And, and I think maybe using acacia, uh, may, you know, using these techniques of partial barrel fermentation, that's all about, about pushing the boundaries and, and trying to make something that is explicitly not lovely, obvious, fruity Sauvignon. Um, you know, if you're gonna bother making alternative varieties, then you, I, I think you, you want to make something that's different, that has something to say. Uh, yeah. can express the variety or, or the vineyard in, in the case of some of these wines. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think with acacia is is fairly neutral wood, but still allows the textured slightly sort of silky, almost slightly waxy occasionally um, yeah. texture to come through. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're right on the time. Um, I guess for me, I mean, we could probably sit here and talk for quite a lot longer, but I guess it was, I, I've had a real kick. I think it's eight aromatics that aren't Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I really enjoyed the exploration. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I think, I hope we learned something along the way. Um, thanks to Chris at New Zealand Wine Growers uh, and to Andrea at The Circle and to Rosemary for that lovely introduction. Um, <laughs> Basking it. <laughs> um, that's it from me. Well, Peter, thank you so much. That was fascinating. They were brilliant wines. Um, and it was just so interesting to see what um, New Zealand is doing with aromatics. Um, maybe I make a very cheeky suggestion. They really want to get them into the market. They make a few more blends or blend them all together. They, the, the field blend from Tiwara Ra was just so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but um, no, there's a future there, but it's, I guess, going to be difficult for New Zealand to, um, to make it a, major section of the market but probably yeah. they don't want to do that yeah. but thank you peter that was a really revelation and chris great uh, choice of wines thank you very much indeed thank you so much for new zealand uh, thank you for the chance to taste the wines always the best always the best gastronomic and uh, another vintage and another success and thank you for peter for a wonderful presentation <laughs> <laughs>